I've been thinking a lot this month of two events that took place in 1993, 30 years ago, that were very, very important personally and academically in my own life and career. And that is the more public release of the unpublished Dead Sea Scrolls, first of all. As you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947, and a portion of them were released over the next decade or so, but up to a quarter to a third, depending on how you count fragments, were not released until 1992. And Robert Eisenman and Herschel Shanks and Michael Wise, you might know those names, were all involved in that. And this video that I'm offering the introduction to here uh, captures a moment in May of 1993 in which I was involved when Time Magazine's editor, Richard Osling, and PBS News, the McNeil Lear Report, came to Guilford College in North Carolina and did an extended program and I was teaching a seminar that summer at Guilford College on the Dead Sea Scrolls and the new, newly released Dead Sea Scrolls. And all this material was very new and Time Magazine had a two page spread on it. So this video captures that moment of May, 1993. And I think you'll really appreciate it. You're gonna see a much younger James Tabor, and I'm teaching at a biblical archaeology seminar that's sponsored by the Biblical Archaeology Society. And the people interviewed in that class or that seminar, I remember well to this day, it's amazing. I've seen them, many of them over the years. It was quite an amazing time. And uh, I published things in Bar Magazine, Michael Wise and I published this fragment that I talk about in the video that some people call the Messianic Apocalypse. All that is uh, out now, and we've had 30 years now to even think about the unpublished scrolls that have now been published. So there's a lot to say, and I've done a lot on it. The other thing, related but unrelated, was February 28th, 1993, through April 19th, the Branch Davidian Waco attack and siege by the ATF, and then the siege carried out by the FBI for 51 days with David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. I've written a lot about that. Uh, there's a lot on my blog. I've been in lots of documentaries and videos, and some are coming out on the anniversary. This book, Why Waco, is still available, University of California Press. And I wrote it with Gene Gallagher, my colleague, who uh, at that time was a professor at Connecticut College, now retired. And I was at UNC Charlotte, and I'm now retired. So you can still get this. It's, it's a real page turner. It's a thrill to read. And if you've fallen for all of the popular characterizations of what happened at Waco, you ought to look at this. It's not what the militia movement says, and by and large, it's not what the government has reported, even in the final FBI reports. You can go to this YouTube channel of mine and hear a composite of my testimony before Congress in 1995. Just scroll on down to the playlist Waco and you'll find quite a bit. The final words of David Koresh, uh, several lectures I've given on Waco that are partly drawn from the book, but the book is more comprehensive. I really recommend it. And also uh, a three hour round table. Anyway, I've studied apocalypticism and the Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, I have an article called From Qumran to Waco, in which I talk about those parallels. So Waco and the Branch Davidian crisis and the Dead Sea Scrolls were actually somewhat related. 
And David Koresh was aware in 93 of some of the work that uh, we were doing and had published in 1992. So that gave uh, me a way to uh, communicate with him and talk about outcomes and possibilities. And we actually worked out a negotiation strategy with his lawyers that would have allowed things to end peacefully. But that's another story. And I will be talking about this later on YouTube because April's coming up next week and I'll be going to the 30th anniversary of the Branch Davidian Memorial. If any of you wanna come, it's open to the public uh, just outside of Waco, Texas. But the memorial is going to be held in Waco. I'll post information on that later. We're expecting quite a crowd. And we'll have a press conference the morning of the 19th and then a regular memorial service and many of us then usually go out to the site itself, which uh, lots of people will be visiting this year. I would think hundreds, if not thousands, but we'll see. But back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. The two books that have incorporated most of my work on the Dead Sea Scrolls, as it applies to the Jesus movement and the emergence of what later became Christianity, but at the time was a Jewish movement within Judaism is the Jesus dynasty where I constantly use the Dead Sea Scrolls and talking about the movement and then Paul's ascent to paradise, which deals with a whole kind of Jewish mysticism that involved apotheosis and ascent to heaven that was also well known in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is not the time to go into all of those details, Waco or the release of the unpublished Dead Sea Scrolls. But I wanted you to see this short report that I found in my archives. And I think you'll find it really fascinating. And some of you will remember those days. We turn now to an update on a very old story. Time Magazine's religion correspondent Richard Osling has a report on the never-ending effort to read new meaning into the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the most important and controversial documents from ancient times to be discovered in the 20th century. They come from the general era when Christianity was born and Judaism took a form that continued up to modern times. Twelve of these priceless scrolls are included in a current exhibit at the Library of Congress in Washington. Caves are like you can just touch them. How they actually got there, I mean, that's an interesting aspect. The exhibit is only one example of the extraordinary public interest in these 2,000-year-old manuscripts. So this is an absolutely splendidly beautiful text of ecstatic mysticism. But we could see from the fragments that they were... Dozens gathered at this Denver bookstore on a recent Saturday night to hear a scrolls expert. I'm talking here about the Jesus movement and the Qumran movement as wilderness Baptist movements. These enthusiasts spent a week of vacation time at a scrolls symposium in North Carolina. They're in the same place and they're preaching this message of repentance. You've got to... And temperatures rose when scholars conferred at the Annenberg Research Institute in Philadelphia. The first part, the first part doesn't matter. Oh no, the first part is halachic. Look what it says. Look what it says. It starts right out with the history. And it says, you know what happened? Wait, 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 wait. After about a page of history, it says, and you know these bums living in our time, you know what they did? Usually specialists work on ancient manuscripts in quiet obscurity with little public notice. But it's a different story with the scrolls. Michael Wise is a specialist in Hebrew and Aramaic, the languages of the scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls fascination, I think, ultimately arises from the fact that, unlike most things from, from antiquity, these things matter. They make a difference in your life every day. If you're a Jew, if you're a Christian, how you think of yourself. This, these things come from the fonts of both of those religions, historically two of the two of the three most powerful you know, religious forces in the Western world today. The scrolls had been hidden in caves near the Dead Sea, not far from a site known as Qumran. The various texts and fragments were found between 1947 and 1960 in a tangle of Mideast intrigue involving Bedouin shepherds, church leaders, scholars, and government bureaucrats. 
The manuscripts included copies of the Hebrew scriptures a thousand years older than those previously available, leading to refinements in the Bibles read by millions. In addition to the scriptures, there are texts dealing with calendars, ritual, laws of purity, Bible interpretation, and even a book on buried treasure. There were over 500 different scrolls, but only in fragments, not a single complete one. Herschel Shanks is editor of the magazine Biblical Archaeology Review. The estimate of the number of fragments making up these over 500 scrolls varies from about 10,000 to 100,000. And many of them just like a fingernail. This vast collection of non-biblical material has sparked intense scholarly feuding and charges of fraud and plagiarism. The first dispute was over access. The original team of scholars working on the scrolls was set up by the government of Jordan, which held most of the texts in East Jerusalem. Israel won control of these scrolls in the 1967 war. The same official team continued its work at a snail's pace while preventing most other experts from seeing the material. That provoked unsubstantiated claims there was a cover-up to protect the Christian religion and wild theories about secret codes and hidden links with Christianity. But in 1991, the text suddenly became available to all comers. Herschel Shanks defied the official team and published the secret scrolls. The photos that we published in a kind of Pentagon Papers case. Uh, we still can't tell you where they came from, but we got through a lawyer who said he represented a, an unnamed client, close to 1,800 photographs of unpublished fragments. Now, anybody can have the unpublished fragments and, and do with them what they want. They can translate them, transcribe them, print them, publish them, or eat them for breakfast in the morning. Now that the scrolls are widely available, there's increasing controversy about what they say and what they mean. Scholars outside the select circle are questioning older theories, raising basic issues even about who wrote the scrolls, where, and when. Most experts who've been working on the scrolls think they were written by a marginal Jewish sect, but some scholars who are not part of the official team suggest the scrolls were written and collected in Jerusalem and thus reflect Jewish mainstream thought of the time. But no matter who wrote them, the writings reflect an apocalyptic vision similar to that of the early Christians. James Vanderkam is on the official team. Both groups believe they were living at the end of time, that soon God was going to come in some way to end history in its normal form. And this affected the uh, way in which they read the scriptures. They have a similar approach to scripture. Scripture, in its prophetic passages mostly, refers to the last days and these are the last days. That's just one example of, of the similarity we find in these two groups. The parallels between the scrolls community and early Christians have excited the public and a new generation of scholars outside the official team. But I want to try to show how the traditions that we have in our Gospels about Jesus of Nazareth have interesting correlations with uh, what we see in the Qumran material. Religion professor James Tabor compared the scrolls with the New uh, Testament at this uh, symposium uh, in North Carolina uh, for uh, grassroots uh, clergy and laity. These are apocalyptic images of judgment. This is the atmosphere of the Gospels. It's the atmosphere of the scrolls. The, the scrolls include Beatitudes, a characteristic form of teaching also used by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. One scroll even uses the title Son of God to refer to the Messiah, just as the New Testament does. Those at the conference were excited by the connection. We tend to think about Christianity as being Christianity, and it sets apart from everything else. And yet here are the scrolls telling us that Son of God was a term in use in those days. And the old saying that it's only applied to Jesus no longer applies. Jesus was a real man in a real society, and he reflects that society. And I want to know what it was. I want to know what that society looked like, felt like, smelt like, and I want to touch it. And if that means touching a scroll, that's what I want to do. I'm uh, so taken with the thought that 
we have the thoughts today that these people had 2,000 years ago. And the continuity of thought through all these thousands of years uh, is, uh, I think, tremendously exciting. It shows you really that on a spiritual level, we are really one with the past, and they are one with us. I like that. I'm always amazed when Christians look at this text and they say, I always thought this was a part of Christianity. And now they're starting to realize this has always been a part of Judaism. And why that's so important to me is that I think a lot of Christians are starting to understand that we have a lot in common, a tremendous amount in common. And the Dead Sea Scrolls represent that. In my tradition in education, uh, we have believed and taught that you cannot be a Christian in the truest sense of the word unless you really understand Judaism, and particularly the Hebrew Bible. We're both branches on a tree, but we have a common root. Yes. And the, and the Dead Sea Scrolls is part of that common root. One of the newly available texts this group discussed has a close and fascinating relation to an important gospel passage about Jesus as the Messiah. In the Gospel of Luke, John the Baptist sends word from prison asking Jesus whether he is the one sent from God. Jesus replies, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. The Dead Sea text lists the same signs of the coming kingdom and predicts the actions of God apparently working through the Messiah. He shall release the captives, make the blind see. He will heal the sick, resurrect the dead, and announce glad tidings to the meek. We've always had uh, parallels between Qumran and the Gospels, you know, New Covenant, Baptism. This is much more than a parallel. This shows that there's a shared technical verbal set of messianic expectations between the two communities and would strongly then push the idea that it's really not two communities, it's one movement. Controversial scrolls expert Robert Eisenman goes even further. He claims the scrolls are a more authentic account of primitive Christianity than the Gospels. How do I differ from the other people in this field? They say this is a preview to what Christianity was in Palestine. I say this is what Christianity was in Palestine. That position is denounced by most scholars in the field, including Lawrence Schiffman, who says carbon dating tests and analysis of handwriting show that the most significant scrolls predate Christianity. All claims to the contrary, attempts to claim that they are Christian, are simply obfuscations based on the ignoring of scientifically gathered data which all scholars agree to. Schiffman, a Jewish scholar, thinks altogether too much emphasis has been put on the parallels between the scrolls and Christianity. So it's impossible to maintain these types of uh, parallels. On the other hand, I think it should be stressed that when we examine the material very, very carefully, we do find ourselves in the kind of worldview from which certain of the ideas of Christianity came. Yet actually, I could quote many disagreements between the scrolls and Christianity. So what we're looking at here is part of the background in the Judaism of the period. Another notable difference is that the Qumran scrolls are zealous about maintaining Jewish law in contrast with the New Testament. Moreover, none of the scrolls ever mentions Jesus by name. Christian scholar James Vanderkam says the scrolls are important both for their continuity and their differences. The scrolls show that uh, one ought not to make wide claims uh, for the uniqueness of Christianity. Uh, one certainly can't say that everything in the New Testament is unique to Christianity because so much of it was borrowed from uh, the kind of Judaism that we find expressed in the scrolls, uh, elements of, of structure, uh, of practice, ways in which uh, the Messiah was referred to, ways in which the scriptures were interpreted. But uh, I think the scrolls help us uh, see where the real uniqueness of Christianity does lie, namely in the affirmation that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. Do you think that people are going to be frightened and scared by all of this down at grassroots level? I think it's possible. It's possible that people will be frightened by the... Because anything that tends to draw, take something away from the perceived uniqueness of Jesus is very threatening to many people. My own view of it is, in fact, again, that it tends to show 
that what we have in the Gospels arises from the first century Palestinian uh, context and is therefore likely to be more reliable historically than we've often thought. So it can, be, it can actually buttress faith or it can be seen to, uh, you know, to somehow be threatening to faith. In, that, in any case, I think there's no way you can run away from facts. Jesus was a spiritual and universal messiah, quite unlike the nationalistic hero awaited by the Dead Sea community. But the scrolls are making many Christians see Jesus, the New Testament, and the early church as less distinctive and more Jewish, and their religion as a continuation and transformation of the messianic movement within ancient Judaism. That's a notable modern-day impact for manuscripts that lay hidden away for 2,000 years in the Judean wilderness.